Was the death of Eddie Van Halen normal, or was there more to his story? Eddie Van Halen, one of rock's greatest guitarists, changed music forever with his amazing riffs, but behind the fame was a life filled with big challenges and personal struggles. So, how did things go so wrong, and why? Join us as we explore Eddie Van Halen's incredible journey, his rise to fame, personal life, tough battles, and the legacy he left behind. Starting life, dating back to January 26, 1955. That's when Dutch musician Jan Van Halen and his Indonesian wife Eugenia welcomed Edward Lodovic Van Halen into the world. Eddie's childhood was shaped by a unique mix of cultures. The family lived in the Netherlands, where his brother Alex was born in 1953, and Eddie followed two years later. Life wasn't easy for them. They faced racism and prejudice because of their mixed heritage. In 1962, when Eddie was just seven years old, his parents made a bold decision to move the family to the United States. As new immigrants who didn't speak English fluently, Eddie and Alex were often bullied. Their mixed-race background made things even harder during a time before the civil rights movement had made strides. Discover interest in music. Yet, in the middle of all that, the brothers found an escape in music. Their parents had dreamed of them becoming classical pianists, but everything changed when they discovered the Beatles. That moment sparked a musical revolution for them, pushing them towards rock and roll. But then, a surprising twist happened when Eddie and Alex had to decide what instruments they'd play. From that moment on, Eddie was hooked on the guitar. He was so committed that he'd even walk around the house wearing his guitar. Practicing chords whenever he could, but it wasn't all music. At just 12 years old, Eddie's dad introduced him to alcohol, hoping it would calm his nerves before performing, just like it did for him. Unfortunately, this bad advice would come back to haunt Eddie, but for now, the brothers were focused on their dreams of stardom. Formation of Band and Rise of Inner Tension In 1972, Eddie and Alex formed the band Mammoth. Neither of them wanted to take on the role of lead singer, leaving that spot open. Enter David Lee Roth, a local teen with dreams of rock stardom. His family's wealth set him apart from the Van Halen brothers, but he had one key thing going for him, a top-notch PA system his dad had bought for him. Roth used that to his advantage, convincing the brothers to let him join the band. With bassist Michael Anthony joining in 1974, the band's lineup was complete. Tensions soon began to brew between Eddie and Roth, though. Their visions for the band didn't always align, and this would become a theme in their rocky relationship for years to come. Eddie's Famous Guitar About Eddie, you should know. He was not only an iconic player, but a guitar innovator. He modified his guitars to achieve unique sounds. Most famously, his custom-made Frankenstrat. This allowed him to blend the tonal qualities of a Gibson with the whammy bar of a Fender, revolutionizing rock guitar. But during their world invasion tour in 1980, disaster struck. While staying in a hotel in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Eddie's beloved guitar was stolen. The Frankenstrat wasn't just an instrument, it was an extension of Eddie's creativity, a tool he had spent years modifying to perfection. The news of the theft quickly spread, and Eddie was devastated. Determined to recover the guitar, he worked with security teams and offered a reward for its safe return. The story became headline news, with fans rallying to support their guitar hero. Just in time for their next show, Eddie's prized Frankenstrat was miraculously returned. Though details of the heist remain murky, the incident showed just how much the guitar meant to Eddie, not only as a musician but as an artist constantly pushing the boundaries of what could be done on six strings. He also popularized tapping, a two-handed technique that allowed for rapid note sequences. These technical contributions should be mentioned to further cement his influence on modern guitar playing. And Roth, always thinking about commercial success, pushed the band to change their name from Mammoth to Van Halen, believing it had more star power. They started out playing backyard parties, winning over fans one by one. The First Break their big break came when they began playing on LA's famous Sunset Strip. As they worked on their debut album, Roth's pop instincts meshed perfectly with Eddie's incredible guitar riffs. 
creating a string of memorable songs. Surprisingly, though, their label chose to release a cover of the Kinks' You Really Got Me as their first single. Eddie wasn't thrilled. He had hoped one of their original songs would take the spotlight. This was just the beginning of his frustration with cover songs, an issue that would cause conflicts later in the band's career. Despite that, Van Halen's self-titled debut album, released in 1978, was a massive success. It soared to number 19 on the Billboard charts, becoming one of the most successful rock debuts of all time. The band was on their way to stardom, and their tour following the album's release cemented their place in rock history. Difference between Roth and Eddie As Van Halen's success grew, the differences between Roth and Eddie became more obvious. While Eddie stayed laser-focused on the music, Roth leaned into flashy gimmicks and showmanship. In 1979, the band released their second album, Van Halen 2, which solidified their reputation as the ultimate party band, shooting up to number six on the Billboard charts. Over the next four years, they barely took a break, touring nonstop and spending only a couple of weeks on each new album. Their third album, Women and Children First, dropped in 1980 and further cemented their platinum selling streak. But behind the scenes, tensions were building. By the time Eddie and Roth started working on their fourth album, things were getting ugly. Eddie's marriage to actress Valerie Bertinelli, just eight months after they met, added fuel to the fire. Roth, already insecure about his role in the band, grew jealous of the media attention Eddie was getting. Eddie, on the other hand, felt like Roth was taking too much control of the band's creative direction and holding him back. Ups and downs of the band At this point, Eddie took matters into his own hands. He secretly re-recorded the band's fourth album the way he wanted it. He named it Fair Warning. Unfortunately, Fair Warning didn't sell as well as their previous records when it was released in 1981, making it their slowest-selling album of the decade. After this disappointment, the band planned a short break, but Warner Brothers quickly pulled them back to the studio, forcing them to create a new album. Roth pushed for the band to record more cover songs, much to Eddie's frustration. But to Eddie's surprise, Diver Down, released in 1982, was a huge success. Roth's ego inflated and tensions only worsened. Roth felt he had outgrown his role as Eddie's sidekick. Meanwhile, Eddie, tired of external input, built a high-tech recording studio in his home where he could work in peace. For six months, he secretly crafted a new sound. And when Roth finally heard it, he was shocked to discover Eddie had traded his signature guitar riffs for synthesizers. This shift was a bold move, but it paid off. Their next album, 1984, was a game changer. Led by the number one hit, Jump, the album sold an incredible 5 million copies in just one year. Van Halen, with David Lee Roth's theatricality and Eddie's stunning guitar performances, became one of the first bands to truly harness the power of music videos on MTV. This played a massive role in bringing their music to a younger audience, contributing to their widespread fame. Including this would illustrate how the band adapted to the changing music landscape and expanded their influence. But despite the massive success, the band was falling apart. Greed started to overshadow their unity. Until then, all four members had shared profits equally. But Roth and the Van Halen brothers felt that bassist Michael Anthony didn't deserve an equal cut. In a move that their manager called the most despicable act he had witnessed in 40 years of the music business, they forced Anthony to give up his songwriting credits and future royalties, reducing him to a paid employee. Even with his increased earnings, Roth wasn't satisfied. He wanted more power in the band, and by the end of the 1984 tour, he made a life-changing decision. He officially quit Van Halen. Those close to the band said Eddie was devastated, realizing he had just lost one of the greatest frontmen in rock history. No matter the exact reason for Roth's departure, one question hung in the air. Could Van Halen continue without him? In November 1985, Eddie Van Halen took a bold step and reached out to solo rock star Sammy Hagar, who was almost a decade older than him. Hagar, despite his own successful career, wasn't sure about joining the band. But, out of respect for Eddie, he agreed to fly down to Los Angeles and meet with him. Once he heard the incredible music Eddie was working on, Hagar couldn't resist the chance to become Van Halen's new lead singer. 
And just like that, the Van Hagar era began. Their first album together, 5150, dropped in 1986 and hit number one on the Billboard 200 charts, surpassing even the success of their previous album, 1984. It was the start of an incredible run, as the next three albums they released over the following decade also claimed the top spot on the charts. But as time went on, cracks started to form. Hagar began to feel distanced from the Van Halen brothers, largely due to their ongoing struggles with alcohol and other substances. Even so, they kept pushing forward. In 1995, the band embarked on the grueling Balance Tour. During this tour, Eddie started experiencing severe pain in his hip, not realizing he was suffering from a vascular necrosis, a bone disease often linked to alcoholism that cuts off blood supply and eventually causes the bone to collapse. Despite being scheduled for surgery after the tour, Eddie chose to push through the pain, prioritizing performance over his health. Sadly, this decision would come back to haunt him later. Meanwhile, tension between Hagar and the Van Halen brothers reached a breaking point. In March 1995, the band decided to release a greatest hits album, sparking a huge disagreement. Hagar was firmly against it, seeing it as a quick cash grab that cheapened their legacy, but the Van Halen brothers overruled him. This only deepened the rift between them, and their once powerful partnership began to unravel. Just two months after Van Halen's decision to release a Greatest Hits album, their new manager Ray Daniels made a big call. The band needed new songs to promote it. The timing couldn't have been worse for Sammy Hagar, who had taken time off to be with his wife as they prepared for the birth of their son, Andrew. Despite the urgency, Hagar and his wife reluctantly agreed to fly to Los Angeles for a quick session. But when they landed at LAX, they received unexpected news. His wife's pregnancy had progressed too far for them to safely fly back home to Hawaii. This sparked a heated argument, ultimately leading to Hagar's abrupt dismissal from the band. What Hagar was unaware of was that Van Halen had a covert backup strategy. Behind the scenes, they had been negotiating with David Lee Roth to contribute new material for the Greatest Hits album. In 1996, at the MTV Video Music Awards, Van Halen stunned the world by reuniting with Roth on stage to present the Best Male Video Award. What should have been a moment of triumph quickly unraveled into disaster. Roth, ever the showman, went off script, basking in the spotlight. A visibly annoyed Eddie Van Halen had to physically pull him away from the microphone. Backstage, tensions boiled over, with Roth and Eddie nearly coming to blows. With the failed reunion, Van Halen found themselves at a crossroads. Their next move was to recruit Gary Sharon as their new lead singer, and they released Van Halen 3 in 1998. Unfortunately, the album flopped under the weight of high expectations. By 1999, the band parted ways with Sharon, leaving fans questioning the future of Van Halen. Downfall to Rise of Eddie Van Halen Meanwhile, Eddie faced a personal crisis. His hip pain had worsened to the point where he needed a replacement, but he postponed the surgery, focusing on music and ignoring his deteriorating health. Finally, in 1999, Eddie had the surgery, and for a brief moment, he found solace in his personal life, spending quality time with his wife, Valerie Bertinelli, and their son, Wolfgang. Just as things seemed to be looking up, Eddie was hit with devastating news. During a routine dental checkup, his dentist noticed abnormal scar tissue in his mouth. After several biopsies, Eddie was diagnosed with tongue cancer. Determined to fight, he quietly underwent chemotherapy in Houston, Texas, and explored alternative treatments. A large portion of his tongue was surgically removed as he battled the disease. In 2002, Eddie proudly announced that he was cancer-free but doctors warned him that if he didn't quit smoking, the cancer could return. Despite his victory over cancer, Eddie's life continued to spiral. In the spring of 2002, he and Valerie announced their separation, and their divorce was finalized soon after. By 2005, things had only worsened. Van Halen was without a record deal or a lead singer, and Eddie was sinking deeper into depression. When Sammy Hagar visited Eddie in 2003, he was shocked by what he found. Eddie was living in squalor, isolated and consumed by his addictions to drugs and alcohol. His physical deterioration was undeniable, even his teeth were a visible sign of how far he had fallen. Eddie, once a rock icon, had become a shadow of his former self, locked in a battle with his personal demons. His physical deterioration was undeniable, even his teeth were a visible sign of how far he had fallen. 
Eddie, once a rock icon, had become a shadow of his former self, locked in a battle with his personal demons. Eddie Van Halen had several notable collaborations that further illustrate his influence beyond his own band. His famous guitar solo on Michael Jackson's Beat It was a massive contribution to one of the biggest pop songs ever. Eddie reportedly recorded the solo for free, not realizing how monumental the song would become. Adding this story can highlight Eddie's reach beyond rock into mainstream pop music. Reunity Van Halen attempted to reunite in 2004, hoping that bringing Sammy Hagar back as lead singer could pull Eddie out of his downward spiral. However, Hagar refused to continue without longtime bassist Michael Anthony, resulting in a tense standoff within the band. Eventually, Anthony had to make significant sacrifices to be part of the tour. He took a considerable pay cut and even signed away all rights to the band's name and logo, just to remain on the road with Van Halen. The four musicians embarked on the 2004 tour, hoping it would reignite the magic that once made Van Halen legendary. Unfortunately, the opposite happened. Eddie's shockingly unhealthy appearance and erratic behavior, often appearing visibly drunk on stage, left fans heartbroken. The man who had once been a rock god was now a shadow of his former self. His guitar solos, once flawless, were sloppy and incoherent, and his once commanding stage presence had diminished. By the end of the tour, it was painfully clear that Eddie was at one of the lowest points of his life, but rock bottom was still lurking just around the corner. After the ill-fated tour, Sammy Hagar left Van Halen once again, and the band gradually faded from the spotlight, their future uncertain. Then, in 2007, a surprising and unexpected comeback took shape. David Lee Roth rejoined the band, resuming his role as Van Halen's frontman, while Eddie's son, Wolfgang, replaced Michael Anthony on bass. This reunion with Roth, combined with Wolfgang's involvement, seemed to offer Van Halen a second chance. Eddie's relationship with his son Wolfgang was incredibly close, especially in the last years of his life. Wolfgang joining the band was not just a professional decision, but also deeply personal. Wolfgang continues to carry on his father's legacy today. Eddie's attempt to revive. But at that point, Eddie's personal demons were never far behind, and they quickly threatened to derail his resurgence. During one concert, Eddie appeared on stage visibly intoxicated, prompting a tense and emotional confrontation with his teenage son. Wolfgang, concerned for his father's health, confronted Eddie backstage, an encounter that would mark a major turning point in the guitarist's battle with addiction. Throughout Eddie's life, there had been numerous failed attempts to curb his reliance on alcohol and drugs, yet this time Wolfgang's unrelenting insistence seemed to strike a chord. Inspired by his son's concern and commitment, Eddie made a firm decision to seek sobriety. This marked the beginning of a long and transformative journey toward recovery. Eddie's personal life also began to improve. In 2009, he met and married Janie Lasowski, a publicist and stuntwoman. During their wedding, Eddie toasted with a glass of non-alcoholic cider, symbolizing a significant milestone in his path to recovery. He also finally gave up smoking, a habit that had been central to his public image for decades. For the first time in years, Eddie went on tour in 2015 while maintaining his sobriety. However, his health began to take a sharp decline, exacerbated by years of past abuse. Last Stage of Eddie's Life In March 2020, as the pandemic swept the globe and strict lockdowns were enforced, Eddie's situation worsened. The closure of Germany's borders prevented him from accessing the life-prolonging treatments he had been receiving there, leaving him in isolation as his health deteriorated. Months later, Eddie was hospitalized with pneumonia, followed by a severe stroke that left him unable to speak and reliant on oxygen. His condition continued to decline when, just a month later, he suffered another massive stroke. On October 6, 2020, Eddie's family gathered at the hospital as his condition worsened. His brother Alex, son Wolfgang, wife Janie, and even his ex-wife Valerie Bertinelli, with whom he had maintained a close relationship, were by his side. As the morning passed, Eddie's breathing grew slower and weaker. With his final ounce of strength, he whispered, I love you to his family, before taking his last breath at 10.14 a.m. Eddie Van Halen's death certificate cited his cause of death as a stroke, brought on by his body's long battle with cancer. However, Eddie himself had unique theories about the origins of his illness. In a 2006 interview on The Howard Stern Show, he made some peculiar claims. 
which captured widespread attention at the time. Regardless of the theories, Eddie's passing marked the end of an era for rock music, and his legacy as one of the greatest guitarists of all time was cemented. Eddie's personal belief regarding his sickness. Eddie Van Halen had a unique theory about the cause of his tongue cancer, one that puzzled many. He believed that his habit of holding metal guitar picks in his mouth while playing his iconic tapping riffs exposed him to electromagnetic fields from the studio equipment. According to Eddie, this exposure was conducted through the pick and onto his tongue, contributing to his illness. While forensic pathologists found it unlikely that this was the direct cause of his cancer, Eddie was deeply convinced otherwise. He reasoned that because his cancer had not spread to his lungs, smoking couldn't have been the cause, an assumption that tragically led him to continue smoking, unaware of the profound mistake he was making. Van Halen Tribute Concert After Eddie's passing, speculation about a potential Van Halen tribute concert began to circulate widely. Fans hoped for a grand celebration of the band's legendary music and Eddie's profound influence. However, these rumors came to a halt when Eddie's son, Wolfgang Van Halen, stepped in to clarify the situation. He confirmed that although a tribute show had indeed been in the works, it was ultimately scrapped due to disagreements among the surviving members of Van Halen. The internal conflicts, which had long plagued the band, resurfaced, preventing the tribute from moving forward. Wolfgang's Announcement by August 2023, Wolfgang made an official announcement that Van Halen was finished as a band, marking the end of a historic era in rock music. But despite the band's dissolution, Van Halen's extraordinary legacy endures. Eddie Van Halen's influence extends far beyond his music. He inspired an entire generation of young musicians to pick up the guitar, many of whom went on to shape the music industry in their own right. His innovative playing, his technical mastery, and his fearless experimentation redefined what was possible with the electric guitar, and his genius will continue to echo through the decades. Though Eddie may be gone, the mark he left on music is permanent. His pioneering style, including his signature two-handed tapping technique, transformed the rock landscape and inspired countless artists across genres. Today, his influence can be felt in the work of guitar virtuosos and bands alike, ensuring that Eddie Van Halen will always be remembered not just as a rock legend, but as a true innovator whose legacy will live on in the hearts of fans and musicians for generations to come.